We've had the privilege uh, the last uh, few Sunday uh, evenings to study from the book of Acts. I haven't been counting exactly which lesson this is. Is this this is lesson 20? And we're getting ready to start Acts chapter 8. So if this goes on accordingly, then when we get to the end of Acts chapter 8, we'll have about 80 lessons. So we will have quite a uh, quite a book. But it's such an important book. We just can't bypass it or go through it quickly. We learn so much about the beginning of the church, uh, how it was started, why it was started, who started it, the uh, the beginnings and, and uh, how it grew and how they worshipped and how they dealt with problems and issues. And all of these things are just so important for us today because they're just as relevant today as they were nearly 2,000 years ago. <clears throat> Last Sunday evening, one of the early servants in the church that were appointed by the congregation to serve tables by the name of Stephen was killed. He was murdered basically by the Sanhedrin, the Jewish high council. Well, after the death of Stephen, a severe persecution arises against the Lord's church. Read with me Acts chapter 8 verse 1. And Saul was consenting to his death, referring to Stephen's death. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So the Christians, with the exception of the apostles, were scattered all throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. So after the death of Stephen then this persecution arose and it was very severe to the point of people's Christians scattering all over that known area. But the apostles stayed in Jerusalem, maybe for a lot of reasons. They uh, thought that there was a great need for them to stay where the church began and help those who were still there and maybe try and uh, do what they could for the church in Jerusalem and try and build it up. But anyway... It says, devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. But Saul ravaged the church, entering house by house and dragging out both men and women and committing them to prison. So this young man by the name of Saul was instrumental in this persecution. He was one of the main players in many ways. But who was this Saul? And why was he so zealous and determined in persecuting followers of Christ. And why is this such an important question? Because after Christ himself, Paul is the central player in all the New Testament. <clears throat> so we need to learn about why Saul did what he did. Where did he come from and why? And, and uh, what caused him to have this attitude and spirit? Well, if we turn to Acts chapter 21, we learn about... Paul's birthplace. In Acts chapter 21, <clears throat> verse 39, Paul, who of course his name was changed from Saul to Paul later on, Paul said, I am a Jew from Tarsus of Cilicia, a citizen of no common... I beg of you, permit me to speak to the people. There Paul reveals that he came from Tarsus of Cilicia, which was the principal city, the main city, the most important city of that area. And this area was in the first century Southeast Asia Minor, which today you would find that in the, in the, in the modern country of Turkey. So that's where Paul was born and raised. It was a very important city in the first century. It was important because it was a large trade center. In other words, the city, one of its, its big things that drew people was its commerce. The merchants of Tarsus were known far and wide as tradesmen, as good businessmen. And Tarsus had become very rich. Paul grew up in a rich area. Paul grew up in a prosperous city. It's one thing we learn about Paul, and of course this was due to the, uh, the savvy of the merchants and the businessmen that lived there in Tarsus. Also, by this time, because so many people 
were wanting to be a part of this prosperity and they were wanting themselves to become wealth, wealthy, then a lot of people had came to Tarsus. And by the first century, its, its population uh, was somewhere around a quarter of a million people. So there was something else about Paul. So Paul grew up in not only a wealthy, prosperous, rich city, but in a major metropolitan city. In other words, he didn't grow up out in a cornfield. He didn't grow up in a little... In a little backwoods town like Jesus did, it was just the opposite. Paul grew up in a very prosperous area amidst lots of people in a very cosmopolitan type of atmosphere. <clears throat> One of the main products in the first century that Tarsus was known for was the quality of its tents. Tents. And of course, we know how important later that comes to Paul. Well, their tents, which were sold all over the known world, were made out of black hair that came from the goats that lived in the Tarsus Mountains, just uh, a few miles outside the city. So they became very, very well known as tent makers. So if you were a tent maker from Tarsus, <clears throat> you were something. You were a well-known artisan, a well-known craftsman, if you grew up and knew how to make tents growing in Tarsus. So Tarsus was known trade center, place of commerce, but also it was known as a university city, as a university town. We have those in, uh, in our country as well. I guess Columbia would be considered a university town and Fayetteville would be a university town. And when you go to those towns, they kind of have a different flavor. They kind of have a different uh, perspective and attitude. Well, so did Tarsus that Paul grew up in. It was one of the most highly sought after uh, universities in that part of the world, probably the top three or four, next to places maybe like Athens or Alexandria in Egypt. So educators, well-known educators and, and experts and scholars from all over that part of the world would come to Tarsus to teach in the schools there. So their schools were very, very well known. But the university there that was so well known had leanings towards Stoicism. Stoicism, you know, being a Stoic. Well, these were very common. This was a common philosophy in the first century. <clears throat> so Paul, or Saul, as he was growing up, would have been exposed, at least for a certain number of years anyway, to the philosophy of the Stoics. And if you remember when Paul went to Athens in Acts chapter 17, uh, some of the people he originally engaged in disputes and conversations were Stoics. So Paul already knew about their philosophy. So regardless of how long Paul lived in Tarsus, and it's very difficult to know, uh, he knew about this philosophy. So, <clears throat> we don't know exactly even when Paul was born. But when you trace his background and so forth, he apparently was just a little bit younger than Jesus. In other words, he was born near the beginning of the Christian era. So that kind of gives us a little feel for, for his birthplace and the kind of place he was born into. In Acts chapter 22 also, we read that he was <clears throat> a Roman citizen. In Acts chapter 22, beginning in verse 25, Paul says <clears throat> he, had been, uh, he had been arrested. It says, as they stretched him forward with straps, Paul said to the centurion standing by, Is it legal for you to flog an uncondemned Roman citizen? On hearing this, the centurion reported to the commander, saying, What are you doing? This man is a Roman citizen. The commander came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? He said, Yes. The commander answered, I bought my citizenship for a large sum. So Paul said, But I was born a citizen. Therefore, those who were about to examine Paul immediately backed away from him, <clears throat> and the commander feared, knowing that he was a Roman citizen, and because he had bound him. Well, Citizenship was not automatically conferred upon people of Tarsus, upon every citizen of Tarsus. 
it was especially out of the ordinary for a Jew from Tarsus to have been granted Roman citizenship. So this was a very, very special, rare honor uh, to be given Roman citizenship. It was typically granted to families that have very high social standing. And if that was the case, we learned something else about Paul's upbringing. He was born into a family totally opposite than Christ. You know, Jesus has basically grew up in, in a very poor family in a, in a poor area. Paul or Saul was just the opposite. Grew up in, in, a, in a high social family in a very prosperous and wealthy city. Um, if you were a Roman citizen and you had been tried for something, then you had the right to appeal to the emperor himself. And nobody, no Roman uh, centurion or guard or anybody could do anything about it. You were untouchable. So when you, when he exclaims here, I'm a Roman citizen, that's why they backed off. Because they couldn't do anything to him. Because he's basically appealing to the emperor. And he had every right to do that because he was a Roman citizen. And being a Roman citizen meant he could also vote, which most people could not do. And he could become member, a member of the Senate, which again, most people could not do. When we turn over to Acts chapter 25, <clears throat> beginning in verse 10, it says, Paul said, I'm standing before Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. I've done no wrong to the Jews, as you know very well. If I'm doing wrong or have done anything worthy of death, I do not refuse to die. But if these are empty charges of which these men accuse me, no one may deliver me to them. I appeal to Caesar. When Festus had conferred with the council, he then answered, To Caesar you've appealed, to Caesar you shall go. And again, that was Paul's right as a Roman citizen. So this was a very rare honor and privilege that Paul had. So Paul, Saul, is growing up very privileged. Having all kinds of things that most people in the first century did not have. Well, Paul has already said, it back in Acts chapter 22, verse 3, that <clears throat> I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, referring to Jerusalem, at the feet of Gamaliel, I was trained in the strict tradition of the law of the fathers, being zealous toward God as you all are today. So he had a Jewish heritage. In Paul's day, rabbis were the teachers. They were interpreters of the law. That was their job. Synagogues were scattered throughout much of the Roman Empire. And these were the places where Jews went to be educated by the rabbis. And of course, this was done by uh, Jewish boys. At that time, there were three main sects of Judaism. There were the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Essenes. The Essenes were the group that uh, basically didn't have anything to do with anybody else. The, these were the Jews who uh, were did not allow females into the order, strictly males. <clears throat> they lived way out in the middle of nowhere by themselves and practiced their religion. And these were the people who were responsible for the Dead Sea Scrolls. You know, being found back in the 40s or 50s there in Qumran. And that was an Essene community. Those were Jewish people that belonged to this uh, sect. The Sadducees that we read so much about in the New Testament, they were a small but powerful sect. And they were way more concerned about this life, in other words, what this life could give them, than what a next life, if it existed, might. The Sanhedrin was primarily made up of Sadducees. The Pharisees were the largest sect of the Jews, and this was Paul's particular sect. That's what he was trained in, was Phariseeism, coming to be a Pharisee. And over time, the Pharisees had kind of built a hedge or a fence around the law of Moses. And what they had done over time, <clears throat> rabbi after rabbi after rabbi, 
had just added to it. <clears throat> so when the law of Moses would say that no work was to be done on the Sabbath, what the Pharisees had done to hedge that in and protect themselves, they had added a whole bunch of details <clears throat> to that particular regulation. So that not only would you not do that, you wouldn't even get close to doing it. And that's what the Pharisees, the rabbis, had done over the years. They had made all of these rules that became traditions. Traditions that God had never given them, but they were, they were done, they were taught by the rabbis, by the Pharisees, to keep people from getting too close to disobeying them. And so that was the hedge. That was the fence they had built around it. <clears throat> and, of course, Jesus denounced them severely for the things that they had done by making these traditions. In Matthew chapter 23, for instance, verse 4, Jesus says to the Pharisees, They fasten heavy loads that are hard to carry and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with their finger. <clears throat> they added... Burden after burden after burden to the Jewish people's lives. And these burdens did not come from God. They came from the Pharisees. <clears throat> Back a few chapters before that in Matthew chapter 15, beginning in verse 7. <clears throat> Jesus says, you hypocrites, talking to the scribes and Pharisees, Isaiah well prophesied of you saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they do worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. See, they were, they were preaching and teaching these traditions and these man-made teachings as if they were from God, as if people had to obey them. But they didn't. They didn't have to obey them. They weren't God's laws. They weren't God's principles. If Saul was the typical Jewish boy growing up, he would have began his Jewish education in the synagogue at about age five. That's when they went to the synagogues to start learning. And then when they turned 13, which is still a major uh, life um uh, point in Jewish boys uh, lives then at 13 that's when they get that's when they started their very serious teaching under a particular rabbi uh, we don't know if that's when Paul started his or not but if so he would have went to Jerusalem to the school there where Gamaliel taught so Paul Saul received the very best religious education that the world had to offer. The very best. So look at what we know about Saul that is so helpful in understanding the rest of his life and, and what he did and what happened to him. Was he <clears throat> was raised in a very prosperous uh, metropolitan area. He was raised in, in a socially prominent family. He basically had everything he wanted. He had the very best religious education. He grew up in a city that was known for its education and philosophy. He also grew up in a city where tent making was considered a, a, a high craft, a very important craft. All of those things are important in Paul in Saul's Paul's later life. So why did Saul persecute Christians uh, to the degree that he did. In Acts chapter 23, he reveals something about himself that explains his motivation to some degree. In Acts chapter 23, verse 6, <clears throat> and then we'll go to chapter 26. Acts chapter 23, verse 6, Then Paul, knowing that one sect were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, cried out among the Sanhedrin brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of a Pharisee. I am being judged for my hope in the resurrection of the dead. Paul was saying, I am a strict Pharisee. I'm about as strict a Pharisee as you're going to find. That's basically what he's saying. I come from Pharisees, Pharisees, 
I've studied to be a Pharisee, and I follow it as closely as anybody can follow it. And then in Acts chapter 26, <clears throat> Paul further reveals when he's before Agrippa, verse 4 and following, My manner of life from my youth, spent from the beginning in my own nation, and at Jerusalem is known by all the Jews. They knew me from the beginning and could testify if they wished how according to the strictest sect of our religion I lived as a Pharisee. The strictest sect I lived as a Pharisee. When Paul wrote to the church at Philippi in Philippians chapter 3, he told the church there in verse 5, he says, I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as concerning the law, a Pharisee. See, he was strict. He was strict. He was so zealous concerning those he believed might harm the Jewish faith. So anyone or group of people that he believed by their teachings or their actions would harm the Jewish faith, those were his enemies automatically. That's how zealous he was. There in the very next verse in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 6, Paul writes, Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, and concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. See, he was zealous. And his zeal was to the point where he persecuted the church. That's how zealous he was. He told the churches in Galatia, in Galatians chapter 1, <clears throat> beginning in verse 13, he, t he told the churches, For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it, and progressed in Judaism above many of my equals in my own heritage, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. He says, if you want to look at all the Pharisees, none of them were more zealous, more steadfast than me. I, mean, I was the strictest, most zealous Pharisee anyone could imagine. So no wonder when Christianity comes along, when, church, when the church comes along, when he hears about what the church is and what it believes, no wonder he wanted to destroy it and everybody associated with it. We read how he consented to the death of Stephen just a while ago. He said he entered homes, dragging men and women off to prison. Off to prison in Acts chapter 22, verse 4. <clears throat> he reveals in verse 4, I persecuted this way to the death, arresting and imprisoning both men and women. It didn't make any difference to him what gender they were. He was going to arrest them if they said they were Christians. Down in verse 19 of the same chapter. I said, Lord, they know that I and beat those who believed in you in every synagogue. He would even go into the synagogues when Christians were meeting them and start beating them. That's how much he hated the church, what he called the way. Because it taught things totally contradictory to his beliefs. Because Jesus and then the apostles, the, the early teachers and preachers all taught that Jesus nailed the law of Moses to the cross. So, so Saul couldn't follow that. No wonder he wanted to persecute and destroy them. And he was convinced he should do as much as he could to oppose the name of Jesus. Acts chapter 26, beginning in verse 9. Paul says, I too thought that I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which I did, which I indeed did in Jerusalem, and locked up many of the saints in prison by authority from the chief priests. And when they were killed, I cast my vote against them. I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being extremely enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. So he would, when he found some that he hadn't locked up, and they were on the run, he chased them down. 
That was the degree of his zeal. And because he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, because he was of the strictest sect, because he had gone further in his religion than anybody else of his contemporaries, he considered it his personal responsibility to do everything he could to destroy the church of Christ. Everything he could. And so many aspects of Saul's early life and his background, though, ended up, I think we see God's providence, preparing him for the work of an apostle. Because God would tell him later that, Paul, I have picked you out from the womb. God knew all that, that Paul was going to do as Saul. He knew all that. But he had a plan for him. And it was an important plan. We'll end up tonight with 1 Timothy chapter 1, something that Paul tells Timothy, <clears throat> beginning in verse 15. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, Paul writes, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. The New King James says, I'm the chief. But that's what it means. I'm the worst of all sinners. Now, he's not looking at his life now, when he's writing that, he's looking at his life from the past. He says, when I go and look at my past, all the horrible things I did, had people beat and put in prison and killed, I see myself as the very worst of sinners. And no wonder he did. But, verse 16 is there. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all patience as an example to those who were to believe in Him for eternal life. He says, I received mercy. He says, I received mercy. We can look at, at Saul's early life and what he did and his persecutions and his, uh, his, uh, his beatings and imprisonment and see that anybody who's willing to repent can be saved. That's a lesson we learned from him. He was a terrible person as far as the church was concerned. But he received mercy because he learned the truth and when he did, he repented. He repented and obeyed God. And that's what God asks people today to do when they learn the truth, to repent and obey God. Whether it's in becoming a Christian by being immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins or if uh, already being a Christian, one is to repent and confess their sins. That's what God wants us to continue to do. Saul becoming Paul. Tremendous lesson from his life. And tonight... While David leads us in this invitation song, if you would like to respond, then we want you to do that as we stand and sing. Let's stand, please.